Well, welcome back everyone. And thank you, Andy and Colin for joining us. So for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna be talking um, about a little bit about easements, a little bit about conservation plans and management plans, and a little bit about additive conservation. And we're really excited to be joined for an informal conversation today with Andy James and Colin Walden from the Texas Agricultural Land Trust. Why TALT as part of this conversation? Because they are in the envious spot of having so much type of range and pasture and grassland in the great state of Texas, but also because TALT has been a leader in thinking about um, both additive conservation as well as thinking about soil health on range land. Um, so let me start with a really quick introduction of Andy. Andy is the Director of Additive Conservation and a Land Transaction Manager at TALT. He has a BS in Rangeland Ecology from Texas A&M, an MS in Natural Resource Management did a stint with NRCS. Um, I don't know how long you've been with TALT, Andy. How long has it been? Uh, just over three years since I started here. Great, that sounds great. And then Colin, who is a land transaction manager, um, was a the range land, manage, range land management specialist with NRCS. Um, until quite recently, from 2009 to last year, it sounds like, Colin. Um, Colin also has a real estate license, is an Oklahoma native, um, went to Oklahoma State. And so welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Thank you. Let me Absolutely. let me start out to sort of set the stage for the two of you and the group, right? Part of this is how are we promoting soil health in our work? And as I talked about yesterday, the touch point, one of the touch points is we are all in the land conservation world and are having conversations with landowners, ranchers, farmers, when they're thinking about doing an easement. So thinking about an easement and those conversations and how you think about promoting soil health as part of some of those early conversations or even as you're thinking about an easement or thinking about what else might go along with an easement such as a conservation plan or a management plan it's useful to be thinking about those kinds of things um, because it really is a touch point it's an opportunity to engage landowners so that's what we're going to start talking about, but also because TALT has been doing such interesting work and thinking about other ways um, to engage landowners on, you know, range land pasture improvement, we want to talk a little bit about the other things um, that they're thinking about and they're doing because it's pretty relevant to all of our work. Um, with that, let me just say to folks that there are four polls in this session. If you go to the polls, you can see them. Um, we're going to talk about them toward the end. So you've got a few minutes, but um, while you are uh, hanging out, if you can go to the polls and just fill them out, that would be great because we'll circle around and come back to them. But let's start, I think, um, Colin, let's start with you because I wanted to start in talking about um, easements, right? So from your perspective and thinking about easements and thinking about TALT's easement language, what is um, TALT's approach to addressing resource concerns or conservation values in your uh, deed of easement. So, uh, you know, we have uh, we have language. Typically, we, we try to use similar or same language in a lot of them, but we uh, it's geared heavily towards conservation values um, and conservation purposes. Because uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to preserve uh, these working lands and, and keep them uh, in agricultural production, wildlife habitat, and natural resource uh, protection. Right. So, you know, we don't have specific uh, 
you know, we don't mention soil health uh, directly in a lot of them, but, you know, going down our list of conservation values that we typically address, uh, looking at wildlife habitat, uh, rare and sensitive plant communities, uh, water resources, natural and ecological features, these all, all these tie back to the soil, right? Mm -hmm. And and so that's, um, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, working lands operation, keeping it in, in ag production those all benefit from healthy soil. So um, we refer back often in, in the uh, in the language of our easement to protecting and preserving these uh, and enhancing these conservation values. So um, those things are, are laid out, they're discussed in our baseline reports. And um, it's a, I think it's all encompassing of, of soil health and ecosystem health, right? Um, right. Even though we don't you know, in paragraph B, we don't say soil health will be maintained at X, right? But it right. it will be if we're enhancing uh, and protecting these other conservation values. Great, that's super helpful. And I think from AFT's perspective, and I think this is probably true of most of the both the public programs um, in uh, participating here as well as land trusts, that most of us do not put language in our easement deed that is prescriptive in terms of management practices, right? Again, because the, the easement is forever, management practices can come and go and change. I do wanna note that we had an interesting conversation a year ago as one of our past trainings with the White Rock Conservancy that is Iowa-based. They are the only ones that I'm aware of that have actually developed an easement that is a soil, what they call a soil health conservation easement. Um, and they are quite prescriptive, which is why they have a different name for their um, easement entirely. I just want to point it out. I don't want to go into it, um, but I believe that we do have that recording of that session, if anybody is interested in our soil health toolkit that um, Beth is going to describe a little later on as part of this training. So if anybody's interested, you can learn more by watching that session. So let's go, Colin, then to talking about um, uh, whether in your easement you make any kind of reference or have a requirement for a conservation or management plan. Is that something that TALT uses either generally as a regular part of an easement or just in some easements? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so, so we don't, um, it's not uh, a standard requirement uh, for a management plan. Uh, you know, as, as most of us dealt with these easements knows, everyone is different, everyone is unique, right? Every uh, farm or ranch is different and every manager or landowner is, is different. And so um, obviously if we're dealing with, with NRCS on, on ASAP, um, you know, there, there's some requirements for those that, that, that we um, we do uh, plans for. But if we're uh, with a, a, a landowner and they've been in a ranching or farming operation for multi-generations and, and they're good stewards, you know, we don't uh, typically need or, or they don't ask, uh, you know, to, to put some kind of plan together. Um, you know, in our, our language, we have obviously permitted uses and prohibited uses. Uh, permitted uses we we go through uh, we have lots of you know things dealing with pasture management things that, that we know that they they will do to continue uh, in their conservation efforts on the property uh, if we deal with a, a relatively new landowner um, and they uh, request it or we feel like they might need it then we can put together a plan for them and uh, the same way as as you mentioned we don't you know we don't put prescriptive um, uh, methods in in our easements uh, uh, a lot of times on our plans they won't necessarily be prescriptive uh, we just kind of put the sideboards on it and, and outline some some things and some practices that they can use uh, that we know already uh, will enhance and and preserve the conservation values and, and the whole purpose of, of why we're here so it's not a requirement uh, it's kind of a, an as-needed basis but it's something that we can provide um, if the landowner needs it and and also we can hook them up and, and um, point them towards a different resource if they uh, would be better served getting another local NRCS office or county extension agents and uh, things like that as well. 
So we're, it's in the relationship business really. So we're there, you know, we're with that, that landowner, hopefully for a long time. And we know that piece of ground for a very long time. And so uh, we want to uh, get them pointed in the right direction if they need the assistance for sure. Well, that's, that's really interesting because that to me, what you just said about if it is, if it's a landowner that's, that you all have a relationship over a long period of time, this might be putting an easement on an additional part of a ranch. But if it's, if it's somebody new, somebody who's either relatively new to ranching or farming or not someone with you have a, with whom you have a relationship, do, do you start with that before the easement is going on? Are you talking about um, resource concerns and talking about rangeland improvement from the get-go so that you, how do you tease out, to talk a little bit more specifically about how you decide when someone could use or would be helped by a management plan? Well, a lot of that that conversation starts, uh, you know, if, if we're going to visit the ranch or if we're, we're looking at it on the map and talking to them, um, what what you find with people is they, they really love to discuss their property, right? And and so through those conversations, again, the, the start of that relationship, sure, they've approached us, uh, you know, they don't, they don't cold call talk and say, hey, I, I want a, a grassland management plan, right? They're looking about, they're interested in conservation easements. And but through that conversation is where we can um, we can pick up on some things uh, th that might benefit them, uh, discuss their operations, some some things, some issues they've had on the ranch, uh, some things that the the easement will help, uh, and that you know if it if it's a funded easement, you know some of the dollars, you know maybe these are some projects they're gonna um, they could accomplish uh, on the ranch uh, by getting some partial funding at least for for the easement. So. It's really in those initial conversations, the truck rides, you know, bouncing around the pasture. Uh, those are the, the most beneficial conversations when you're uh, initiating a relationship with land there. Great, great, that's helpful. Um, can you also, so you mentioned that if you are doing, um, if you've got a project that is a ASEP, so Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, the federal program, ALE, agricultural land easements, the sub part that's focused on farm and ranch land protection. Um, if you were doing a grassland of special significance project, which I believe that you have done a few of, and I'm going to guess that several of the land trusts and programs on this uh, in this training have done GSS projects, that does require a grassland management plan, right? So can you talk a little bit, and, and and I believe you said that you guys write those plans, right? Again, you've got that expertise, your rangeland management. I mean, this is, this is something that you know, so it's not hard for you all to write them. But can you talk a little bit about what is in those plans and whether mm -hmm. you have used the fact that a landowner might have one of those plans to sort of circle back around and have a conversation about resource concerns or range or pasture improvements like how, how do you how do you put the plan together and then how do you use it to sort of keep having conversations with folks yeah you bet um yeah the, we uh, you know during the easement process you know we'll have a a visit for a baseline report, which uh, can tell you a lot about the place as well. But we, um, again, we try not to get um, in in the weeds and too specific uh, on the plans. Obviously, there there's some requirements we put in. You know, we need to know, uh, we need to fill out what what their goals and objectives are for the ranch. Um, if we know a little bit about the history, the the history of their operation, or if they're new to it, you know, we can. Uh, try to find out as much as we can about what what the past management is and then uh, we provide them uh, with some some uh, conservation practices that that can be beneficial uh, a lot of it kind of ties back to what would you would see in the nrcs uh, plan but again it's it's really just giving them a resource to to think about and to look at these practices and how they could implement them, um, the ones that they need and then again it's uh you know, if something's not on the list, if something's not in the plan and they have some ideas, then they, they contact us, bounce them off of us and 
and uh, we, we talk through uh, the process and, and uh, how it is going to, again, enhance conservation values. Um, so, um, again, they're, they're a little more generic than if you had, you know, a consultant come out and, you know, and spend a week with you on a, a detailed grazing plan, a grazing schedule, that kind of thing, right? We leave that to, uh, to, to them or if they do want to go down that, that route with a private consultant, but we can provide them with a, a good general overview and, uh, and a good base, a good starting point for a plan um, as they move forward. And then do you have converse, like, do you circle back with them when someone's doing a stewardship visit to, to sort of talk about the plan and conditions and how things are going? Yeah, I think, and that's great. And again, we're, we're very fortunate at Talk to have a, a great batch of, of land stewards that make the visit, the annual monitoring visits. Um, you know, obviously for, for our easement purposes, you know, we're, we need to go make a, a visit to the ranch or farm, but also um, with the, the level of expertise that our uh, our stewards have, um, and they're in, involved in the in the conservation circle, at, you know, attending meetings and, and furthering their education all the time. And so, yeah, it's a great opportunity for them to to go over things. You know, how how are things looking? Have you had any issues this year? You know, and start that discussion. And again, it's all about that relationship and they the landowner feeling comfortable asking you and, and, and talking to you about it. And, and if, if we if we don't know the answer, we can't um, uh, address the, the questions they need in the detail they need on their ranch, then, then we know uh, who we can direct them to and get them hooked up with the right people. Right. OK, that's very that's very helpful. Um, before we go to Andy to talk a little bit about additive conservation, Let's talk a little bit. Let's go to these polls um, to uh, to see sort of how how participants um, are are handling management plans. So poll question number one, do you discuss soil health or conservation objectives when you're monitoring easements? Um, you know, looks like uh, most people probably yes sort of as optional if a landowner says hey I want to talk about resource challenges or concerns I'm having or things aren't going well um, that seems like it comes up and then a few people say we don't really feel that we have the expertise hopefully um, hopefully this this training is helping to build the expertise and then some people it's nice to see that there are some participants um, who are already providing um, information around both technical and financial resources that can help um, with those conservation objectives. So let's go to poll number two. Has your land trust or agency used any of these, um, any of the following to compensate landowners for implementing specific conservation practices. Um, one has done overlay easements, which again might be providing additional financial compensation if a landowner is being asked, say, to not do something or being asked to do something specifically. Um, nobody has said anything about pay for performance or does not seem to have sort of come separate contracts around pay for performance. And then what is really nice to see is that there are a number of um, quite a number of you who are already using the federal regional conservation partnership program, um, which is a good way of combining farm or ranch land protection with being able to bring those financial assistance dollars to a farm or ranch as well. And let me put a plug in that, Andy, to ask you whether that's something that our, that TALT has been using at all. Um, but let me just go through the rest of these polls. Um, if you have a, have a requirement for a conservation or a management plan, do you require the landowner to implement the practices? Seems like um, a number of you do. Some do it only on highly erodible land. That is the ASEP requirement. 
um, and quite a, num quite a number of you don't require that those plans be implemented. Um, and I realize I should have done these polls in the reverse order, but that it does seem that um, with the exception of one of you who actually does require managing land in a particular kind of way, that some of you require a conservation management plan. Um, another of you, another bunch of you include a management plan only if the landowner um, agrees to it, which seems to be the TALT strategy, and some don't ever um, require a, a conservation or a management plan. Um, so it's interesting that folks are sort of all over the place. Um, I will say that AFT uh, has not been one to typically require a management plan. And certainly when we do have a management plan, it is only a, a voluntary document. Um, a landowner is not required to adhere to what is in the plan. We are increasingly requiring management plans on our newer easements that we are doing, and we are using them quite, uh, um, I don't want to say aggressively, I'm not sure that would be the word, but we are using them in our buy, protect, sell um, projects where we are really trying to encourage regenerative agriculture practices. So where we've got a buy, protect, sell project, um, we work very closely with the incoming producer to focus on management objectives. And so those management plans are, um, uh, they're not prescriptive, but I think that they're pretty detailed. And if anybody would like a, a copy or to see um, how we are doing that, I'm happy to provide that. Um, the other thing that we have been doing, and this I think is, um, a question I would have for those of you who have land that you own in fee, for those types of lands, it is probably worth doing some kind of soil health assessment or a management plan with the tenant who is on that land trust or state owned property. And I'd be curious of people's examples and whether they are doing that already. AFT has worked with a land trust for a bunch of properties that they own and we have written, again, because we now have expertise in this, like TALT has, um, to write some soil health management plans. Um, that money to do that is also available through NRCS. So for those of you who are managing your own land that you own in fee, thinking about how to um, use a management plan and do a soil health assessment to focus on those lands that you own is probably something to be thinking about, maybe include in your action plan. So with that, um, if folks have particular thoughts um, on use of management plans or conservation plans, please feel free to um, put these comments in. Uh, I'll come back to them in a little bit, but let me go to Andy now, because Andy, your title is um, Director of Additive conservation. Um, talk to us about what TALT means by additive conservation. And does this translate into helping landowners focus particularly on pasture management or pasture improvement and rangeland improvement? Talk to us a little bit about the approach. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I'll kind of just you know, kind of how we approach things and, and kind of how Colin went kind of discussed in the very first or early on is we don't really necessarily talk about soil health specifically when somebody approaches us or comes to us. They're coming to us for soil health is not usually the first words out of their mouth. Um, but where things really kind of take the turn and really kind of go back towards soil health um, is when we start getting into the additive conservation opportunities. Um, and so when we get to, when landowners may come to us because they know that we're working in that space, or we may realize, hey, this is a landowner that maybe is already doing some of these things, we should see if they want to take advantage of, of an opportunity that might be available to them. Um, and so we, that kind of comes both ways. But 
let's kind of get into, you know, add, additive conservation in, in our minds is, is really uh, maybe conservation opportunities uh, that a landowner may be compensated for that's kind of above and beyond what, 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 what would be normal. So um, growing a crop, um, selling their calves uh, at the end of the year, um, you know, something kind of commodity based um, operation where they're getting paid for, for that, for that service um, or, or, or that, um, you know, beef as a product or whatever is kind of normal stuff. So what's on top of that? Um, and, and a lot of those opportunities really in our mind go, kind of go back to the ecosystem services. And uh, in right now, you know, the big hot topic is, is carbon. Um, we can get into biodiversity, water, and, and more kind of down the road, but um, we, that's real, really where things start leading is is back to carbon, which on a grazing and on a rangeland scenario, we're really a lot of times looking at either carbon sequestration back in the grasslands or maybe an avoided conversion type project that would be soil carbon based. So all time back to soils. Um, how does this, you know, kind of hitting your question on how does this kind of lead to improved soils or improved rangelands? And really it comes back, it, it, it's an incentive. Um, in our minds, money talks, right? So um, if the landowners, one, maybe there's landowners that are already doing some of these things, that's great. What's helped to get them compensated for what they're doing? Maybe there are others that are interested in doing some of this stuff, but they're not sure if it makes sense financially. Well, if you can make some, if you could be compensated to in, to implement some of these practices or be, you know, or, and do some of these things, that would get you either just some of those carbon or, or, you know, let's talk carbon primarily <clears throat> for, for this example. Um, if they can be incentivized and provided, you know, and paid for, for doing those, those practices, then all that kind of helps tip the scales and those landowners now are now jump on board. So, when we have opportunities to uh, think about these additive ways to be compensated, we're thinking about it from a way that the landowner is going to, it's going to incentivize them to, to take on these new opportunities um, and make these changes on their property, which is one going to help us because now we have an easement on the property. So we have that interest. Um, so it's going to encourage everybody. It's just kind of a win, win, win scenario for everyone involved in most cases. Thanks for that. So, so these are for the most part private market opportunities that are particularly on the either the carbon credit market or um, soil carbon based avoided conversion. Um, what role and we're going to talk we're going to talk specifically tomorrow about carbon markets in more detail um, uh, with our colleague Bonnie McGill and others who are going to join us. But um, what's what's TALT's role? Is it, it, it is it sort of identifying the opportunities for landowners who are interested to say, hey, here is a here are the ways that you can potentially sell carbon credits. Are you bringing? Are you vetting? private companies to sort of say to landowners, you might want to work with this company. How, how do you, what, what's the TALT role in this work? Yeah, so, and you kind of covered se se several of them for sure. And what, what I will say, kind of just preface this before I get into it is TALT is probably taking on a bigger role in this aspect than a lot of other land trusts maybe we, we've talked to and, and have worked with um, over the last couple of years as well. But TALT is taking a, a, a pretty big step in, in trying to help bring everyone together for these opportunities. Landowners, the developers, um, even have had discussions with buyers. Um, and so uh, the first thing that we want to be is, is one is a resource to that landowner. We're out to help that land. Our, we're a landowner first, helping them out um, and, to, and to create one opportunities within two to, to navigate this space that is somewhat kind of wild, wild west um, at this point. And so what I, uh, 
I, I can say right now, I was trying to add up in my head earlier. I, I think we are actively engaged or, or have had discussions with, I, I think seven different, um, either for-profit or non-profit developers. And part of that process is trying to figure out who, who are they? Um, what are their goals and objectives? What um, do their carbon conservation agreements look like? Who's going to retain ownership of the carbon? Who's going to pay for um, various costs? Um, who's going, you know, how are you going, how are they going to split the revenue? Kind of working through that with those developers. Um, and we, and I, I can tell you is that not a single one of them are the same. And so, uh, so, so and I'll just use an example. Some of them, um, they're actually going to take ownership of the carbon. Um, some of them are not, are going to, the ownership of the carbon is going to main, be maintained with the landowner. Um, some of them, when it comes to who takes ownership of the carbon, some of them take everything associated with the carbon. Some of them only take ownership of the carbon that is part of the project. And that can get down a whole, a whole nother rabbit hole. But, uh, so they're all, that's just one example. They're all over the spectrum and you've got to find um not not every developer is going to necessarily mesh with a particular landowner and so can we find hey here's these two or three opportunities that really line up for you but maybe these you know same two or three opportunities may not match up for another landowner they you know the one landowner may not want to own the rights they may from a liability perspective they may want to want the developer to own those carbon so there's it, and I don't want to get into, we, we can spend hours talking about each little individual right. detail, but, but there's those kinds of things are things that talk is working with these developers to try and understand. Um, the, the other thing that talk has done is we actually have an ongoing pilot project, um, fully in the works, expected to have several, several contracts agreed to here in the next month or two. Um, and we've got several more that are kind of in, in the works. Um, this one that we're working on in particular is, is an avoided conversion, um, opportunity. Uh, and, uh, one of the things that TALT has spent a lot of time on is the eligibility criteria. And so developer came and said, there's this many acres that are eligible and TALT got to looking and we really think that a different number of acres should have been, a, should have been eligible based on the pro protocol. And so I think that's one thing that, that TALT does have is we try to understand those protocols and really be able to take, you know, from the landowner's perspective, we actually get end up increasing those eligible acres by about 25% versus what was initially presented to the landowner. So uh, we spend a lot of time um, understanding and have the GISK capabilities to develop those models that those developers are probably using to understand what's really out there and what those landowners should be capable of, of getting. Um, but then that pilot project, a portion of, of what happens is there's a monitoring component to these carbon projects. And so one thing that TALT is looking to do, and it really makes a lot of sense, is we have to do an annual monitoring event anyway. So in this particular pilot, um, there's an agreement with the developer that we're going to take on a portion of that monitoring aspect component. Um, and there is, I mean, obviously there would be a pay, we will be receive a payment for that from the developer, but it's really more efficient. We're going to be there. We're going to be on these properties anyway. The developer, you know, is a nationwide developer and they do have people throughout the United States, but they don't, they're not that big. So, it's really going to be more efficient. We're going to be able to put our eyes on the property to see if there's been any cultivation or if there's been anything that's been done, you know, soil disturbance wise, we can handle that and then report back to the developer. So it, it really also, the developer is not going to have to work with the, the developer wanting to, you know, there'll be some interaction with the landowner, but that landowner will also know that we're the trusted source. We're the land trust that they choose to come work with anyway. So now we can help relay that information and kind of, serve as that uh, help back to the developers. So that's that's another way that TALT's kind of getting involved um, on the monitoring side. And right. then 
I think we're always just trying to vet different businesses or, you know, different developers um, and maybe buyers to an extent. And what I'll tell you is that there are some good ones and there are some people who are trying to do good. And there's some folks that, man, we sure don't say, we, I can tell you right now, we just do not trust and do not like the way they come across. So, uh, and we tend to share with land owners. These are the ones that we haven't had, you know, we see good things in, and these are the ones we have some questions about. And so it, it, it can vary pretty, I say by the amount of, amount of in, the amount of uh, work that we put into these things is pretty heavy and probably more than what a lot of other land trusts may be willing to do. But we feel we're here to act on the best, you know, way that we can for the landowner and, and to get those opportunities and to make sure they're protected. Great. Thank you so much. That is super helpful. Um, seeing what time it is, I want to leave plenty of time for folks to ask you all questions and to address some of these questions in the chat. So let me start by um, seeing, we're going to go back to management plans for or conservation plans for a minute. Um, Stacy notes that in Maryland, the Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation requires farms to have a conservation plan. Um, Frank made a good point here, um, saying that Maryland requires soil and water quality plans as well, but due to USDA rules, they can't always access those plans. And how do you talk about a conservation plan if you don't have a copy of the plan? I think that's an excellent point. I'm wondering whether people have experience with that. I would assume as a, as a landowner, I was given a copy of our forest management plan. So I would assume that a conservation plan becomes also something that a landowner has. So it's probably something that you could ask the landowner, if you know, you could talk it over with them. But I wonder if people have um, if people have any perspectives on that. And uh, let me also just see if folks have particular questions for Andy and Colin. And real, real quick, I might just kind of throw in uh, to Frank's uh, kind of comment there. That would be where I would go is directly as the landowner. If there's a plan on that property, that landowner has access to it. You would hope, once again, like Colin said, this is a relationship business. Right. If you got a good relationship, hopefully they'll share it with you and, and you could maybe see and maybe and then maybe help that landowner to either implement or, or understand that plan. So it right. there. It, yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's important to think about it. Like it's not it's that relationship and being able to say to a landowner, like, it's not my place to be telling you what you're doing with your conservation plan, but here's things that you identified as things that you were interested in doing and how can we as the land trust help you to be able to do the things that you wanna do, right? So if that is to try and identify the financial resources or in some cases, the private market opportunities for additional payment for things. Um, but it's, it's, it's making sure that, that you're not coming across as being a regulator. I mean, although I understand that in a couple of cases, people or entities are, but for the most part, it's just building that trust and to encourage a conversation to be able to help, help a landowner achieve those goals that they are looking to to achieve right and, and, and chris i think what we mentioned when we spoke the other day is that we we believe in 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 outcome-based conservation right um you know you don't want your plan to be too restrictive or or um you know you people need to be adaptable these operations need to be able to adapt with climate and conditions and all that and so we want to focus on the out conservation outcomes you know preservation of our soil water uh, plant communities and so Again, how can we how can we help them achieve those goals? And and if those goals uh, produce some additional uh, monetary incentive, that's great. Um, you know, there's some opportunities with this additive conservation where if somebody's on the fence about 
going into a conservation easement on their property, um, we can say, hey, here's here's some potential dollars as well. Um, and that can that can kind of get them over that hump. And and so by the added to conservation, we end up with a conservation easement. And that's that's how, uh, you know, Andy referred to the win win all around. So. Right. Right. That's great. Um, out of curiosity, does TALT have any, uh, I don't know whether you've gone after RCPP um, projects you do. Do you yes. have any projects where you are trying to use money for both easements and for bringing conservation cost share dollars to the same ranch no. or farm operation? Not not doing RCPP. Our RCPPs have been solely focused on the easement dollars. Right. Um, I am aware of one other RCPP in Texas that is attempting that, and it's been an absolute nightmare to get wow. multiple practices and multiple things through an RCPP. Based on what I've known from that one, I would avoid it like the plague, um, because it's been it's it's been a, it's been a very rough experience for that RCPP. Uh, uh the, the leader of that deal um but so i think so far we've only focused on just easements within that area but we would we would love to uh is the answer we just i think it, there's it's it's difficult so far in our experience and others experience to get that done um but but uh yeah we we hope to offer um whether it's within our cpp or not some other opportunities like that um uh, yeah, that, you know, Go ahead, Andy. No, I will add, say we did put in a grant recently through another funder that was actually going to be implementing uh, management practices back on and as, as a cost share program back onto our easements. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were trying to just obtain funding for things like brush work, things so basically helping our landowners that pot of money instead of them. We were going to treat it like an equip project. Right. But it was that funding would have been available to our landowners and not just you know your county or your region or your level so um it would have been a statewide type opportunity um I'm not sure how that's going to work out and we may not that's kind of an out of the box thing so i'm not sure how our funders gonna gonna see it but we're we're we're, we're trying to, to see if we could do something like that for sure right no that's great and we do know of a couple examples i'm thinking of sonoma county california where they do i think maybe uh, Marin Agland Trust do have pots of money where they are putting to the cost share for the landowner on the side where a landowner is going after federal equip dollars or things like that. So there are some examples of where um, public programs anyway are trying to come up with the, with the cost share support to landowners. Um, I'm curious. Oh, well, I was going to ask one question, but it's, I see what time it is. Um, if I will ask this, but, and people are welcome to put it in the chat. If there's anybody um, on the, in this training whose land trust or public agency is, um, has, has done an RCPP project that has combined both easement support with conservation um financial assistance for on the ground conservation practices would welcome knowing about it because i think that would be valuable given andy and colin's experience with their colleagues in texas who've not had a good um a go of it that we would welcome examples where it really has worked well um so if anybody has such an example we would love to know about it but I see that it is now lunchtime for everybody. So I wanna say thank you again, Colin. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. As always, TALT is doing innovative stuff um, and we really appreciate um, hearing about it, hearing about your thinking about it and the way that you engage farmers, ranchers, and landowners on this. So